Okay, welcome back. We're looking at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek, section 2.3, the nominative and accusative cases. You remember that in the last video, I gave you a quick rundown in English of the ideas of grammatical case, nominative and accusative, and the associated ideas of subject and object. So you remember the nominative case is like a little label that attaches to a noun, that's what we looked at so far, um, to tell you that this noun is the subject of the verb. The accusative case is like a little label which attaches to the word to tell you that this noun is the object of the verb. So now I want to show you the same thing in English using this example, picking up on some of the things that Duff's saying in section 2.3. First, take a look at this sentence. Anthropos, blepe, angelon. Anthropos, blepe, angelon. Now, the first thing to do always, always, always when you've, you're presented with a sentence is to find the verb. And that's easy enough because you've been looking at the vocab towards the end of the chapter and therefore you know that blepe is the third person singular form of the verb I see. It comes from blepo. So here's what I would do, especially in the early stages, put a little box around it, write verb, write uh, the lexical form of the verb underneath blepo to remember, to remind you what it uh, means. Blepe, that's highlight the, uh, the ending of the verb. Blepo, blepe, blepe, third person, singular. He sees, or it sees, or she sees. Now, because this is a third person verb, it's quite likely that the subject of the verb will be something other than he or she or it. It will be something else in the sentence. And in this case, you can see that there are two other words in the sentence. Anthropos, meaning, pause the video, tell me what it means. Rack your brains, can you remember? A man. And angelon, that's easy, come on. What does angelon mean? It comes from angelos, and it means angel or messenger. So these are two nouns, and one of them is the subject of the verb, and the other is the object of the verb. Now, when you're looking at a noun, just as you have a stem, blep and an ending in a verb, blep, the stem and ending a, so also in a noun you have the stem, anthrope, and then the ending, os. And in this noun over here you have the stem, angel, and the ending, on. And you've seen, because you've read Duff, pages 24 to 26, section 2.3, that these endings are the little case labels which tell you what the word is doing in the sentence, how it relates to the verb. The little label, I'll stick with the same colour, the little label os is the nominative singular case ending. So I'm going to write nominative singular. When you're working out these sentences, just scribble on the, the, the text you've got, write it out again and scribble it on it if you need to. So nominative singular case ending. And you know that the nominative case is the, is the little label that tells you that this word is the subject of the verb. So I'm going to write subject. There we are, subject. Right. So that's the subject of the verb. Now that's the next thing you should be looking to find after you find the verb. You find the verb, um, he sees, we can even write that under there. So, he sees. The next thing you should look for is the, uh, the nominative case, the subject of the verb, if there is one. And in this case, it's a man, anthropos, and highlight it to remind yourself, this is the subject of the verb. How do you know it's the subject of the verb? It is not because of the word order. It is because there's this little label on it, the nominative singular label, and nominative tells you it's the subject of the verb. It's singular, therefore it's a man and not men. We'll come to the alternatives in a moment. And then you look at the rest of the sentence, see what else you can find. And of course, lo and behold, what you find is another noun, angelos. Now this is a, it comes from uh, angelon, uh, sorry, <laughs> angelon comes from angelos, meaning an angel or a messenger. And the case ending here is on. This is accusative singular. That tells you it's the object of the verb. So what that means is in English, because English is a subject verb object, object language, we write a man, 
sees an angel like this. Now one final tweak, remember I mentioned about the verb, if it's in the third person singular it can have a subject other than he or she or it, and in this case it's the man which takes the place of the subject that's built into the verb, it sort of displaces it. It would say he sees if there was nothing else here, no other subject to take its place, but because there is one, a man pushes that out of the way. So a man, the subject, sees the verb, an angel, angelon, anthropos, blepe, angelon. Now, here's the bit where we figure out whether or not you followed all that. Let's suppose I wanted to change this around so that instead of saying a man sees an angel, it said an angel sees a man. What would I do? Would I change the order of the words? Well, I might do. It might actually be more stylish Greek if I changed the order of the words. But the fundamental change that I'd need to make would not be to change the order of the words, but simply to change the labels on the nouns. Now, angelos is not the object, angelos is now the subject of the verb, and anthropon, because it's anthropon, not anthropos, is now the object. So this, the word order isn't, this, this word order probably wouldn't work very well in Greek, but as far as the labels go, and angelos, an angel, sees a man. You've not changed the word order, or you haven't needed to change the word order in order to change what is the subject and the object. What you need to change is the little case endings. Now, suppose we want to go one better, and instead of saying that, what we want to do is to say men, plural, see angels. This is where it's going to get clever. Men see angels. Well, if it's men, and that's the subject of the verb, we're going to have to have the oi ending, you can see that in the table. The nominative plural ending is oi, logos, logon, logoi. And the accusative plural ending is us. That now says men, and this says angels, and this is the subject, nominative plural, this is the object accusative, plural. But there's one other change that we need to make now. Can you guess what it is? Have a look at this sentence. Anthropoi, blepe, angelus. Take five seconds, have a look at this and see if you can work out what's wrong. Did you pause the video to have a look, see what's wrong? Of course, the problem here is the verb is still singular. And the number of the verb must be the same as the number of its subject. So we don't want the third person singular verb, we want the third person plural verb now, because we've got anthropoi. So you go back to the previous chapter and you remember your paradigm, which is luo. Go on, pause the video, see if you can complete it. Luo. Did you pause the video? Luo, luais, luai. Third person singular. Luomen, luete. Luusin or Luusi. And so we need to change this. Blep Usin. And we would certainly have the new here. Usin. We would certainly have the new here because there is a vowel at the start of the next letter. That's one of the reasons why you'd keep the new there. So anthropoi blepusin angelus now means men see angels. So just to recap, the way that you identify the subject in a Greek sentence and the way that you identify the object is by looking at the cases. The case is like a little label which tells you what the word is doing in the sentence and in particular with nominative and accusative. Nominative tells you that this word is the subject of the verb and accusative tells you that this word is the object. The subject is the person doing the action, the object is the person having the action done to them. And so there you are. That's a brief, not very brief, explanation of section 2.3 and so on. Now, if you've got any problems, any questions about that, then please do stick something in the comments and I'll address them in a later email. But in the next video, we are going to go on and pretty much, I think,
complete this chapter. We'll look at the definite article and then special uses of the definite article. And then at the end of the chapter, I'll go through some of the exercises with you, some of the translations, uh, practice 2.4 and 2.5. 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week. Keep going, keep working hard, keep memorizing the vocab, keep working on these paradigms, and we'll have you reading the New Testament in no time at all. Okay, God bless. See you next time.